Okay, so as you know, in the early 1800s, a spirit of reform gripped the United States. And this coincided with the Second Great Awakening, which meant that Christianity was the heart of a lot of the reform movements. Those that dealt with, for example, the abolition of slavery or the temperance movement or the anti-war movement or even a movement to further create an equality between the sexes. This is the thing. Americans are very individualistic and we are not very good at moderation. This is true even though we operate within a political system that was created exactly to stop the excesses of democracy. After events like Shays' Rebellion way back in the 1700s before we had a constitution, the founding fathers determined that, well, if you have simple majorities, sometimes big groups can just trample over little groups and that's not necessarily a good thing. So let's throw together a system in which these guys and these guys might have entirely different interests, but they'll have to speak with each other and debate with one another and seek some compromises to get anything to push forward. That means the Founding Fathers wanted a lot of gridlock in our system because people often just dig in and they don't like to compromise. Perhaps that's why we seem to be, as a people, a great lover of factions. We tend to split apart into smaller groups within even the bigger groups that we tend to join on our own. Now, you might think I'm about to talk about politics, which would be an obvious place to go, but no. What I am interested in today is illustrating this uh, factionalism that Americans seem to be so great at within the social movements of the early 1800s. Let's start with the temperance movement. The mostly women who founded the Temperance Society wanted to solve the problem of drunken excess within their communities. That's a good common goal. Unfortunately, a split grew within the society over a push for abstinence that began to seem rather extreme to some. One faction of the Temperance Society wanted people to no longer have uh, any drinks at all. They wanted abstinence pledges to be cold water, which meant that you couldn't have any sort of drink that had any sort of alcohol within it. Whereas another faction of the Temperance Society wanted to go more moderate. Americans were drinking more than Europeans. They were, oh, we like to liquor it up. <laughs> and this faction said you could go from doing that to just having, you know, some beer and wine. After all, even the Puritans drank beer and it's not like the Puritans were known for going out on big benders. Hanging witches, yeah, but benders, no. The American Peace Society was another group that saw a split. This is an anti-war group, and the founders of the American Peace Society were Christian ministers, and they did not agree with aggressive warfare. However, some of the members of society ended up becoming early pacifist, and they proclaimed war is never, ever, ever, ever justified, even in cases of self-defense. And in fact, self-defense isn't really justified. So I guess if you're an individual and someone's coming after you, run, run fast, because uh, you're not allowed to hit back. While the idea that might does not always make right gained a lot of traction, this conception that national defense or self-defense on an individual level was somehow immoral was viewed, especially per the American understanding of natural rights, as a bit extreme. Now, I'm not saying that extremists never had a point. For example, 
While various groups could get a lot of Americans on board the slavery is wrong train and should probably eventually maybe be reduced and fade away gradually sometime in the way far future somehow. Abolitionists who recognize the true humanity of people being held in bondage wanted that institution to collapse right then, completely, absolutely, forever, and they were on the fringe. Let's think about some other types of radicalism in the antebellum era. Robert Owen, a Welsh guy who moved to the U.S. in 1824, wasn't a Christian at all. He was a humanist. And he founded something called Utopian Socialism. What was that? Well, it was this idea that people could organize themselves into communities with no socioeconomic classes. It was an early form of socialism without any sort of revolutionary element in it. When I say revolutionary element, I mean there was no proletariat that had to overthrow the bourgeois. That's something that comes along later with the writings of Marx and Engels. Anyway, Owen started a classless community in Indiana, but it failed within just a couple of years. There were multiple, like, I don't know, nine, 10, 11 other Owenite communities that cropped up all around the United States, but all of these failed as well. Uh, this is because people fought within them. There's a lot of factionalism in the communities and they, they weren't economically viable. When people had cooperative labor, for some reason, things didn't get done. To understand why these socialist experiments were considered pretty radical, you just need to recall that The Wealth of Nations was published in 1776, and the United States is built on a capitalist economy with a conception of private property being bound tightly to liberty. Another group of people who were considered kind of way far out there were the Shakers. And the Shakers were people who shook like the Quakers. They actually came from the Quakers who quaked. And they had a leader in the United States who said sex was the root of all sin. So everyone within a Shaker community should become completely celibate forever with no marriages either. And, well, doesn't that sound a little extreme? Going in the totally opposite direction were Oneida communities, which believed in communal living like the Owenites, but they also thought that marriage shouldn't exist except for like the Shakers, except for it wasn't so they could be celibate, it was so they could have as much sex with whomever they wanted to have sex with within the community because that brought society closer together. And the founder of the Oneidas actually coined the term free love. <laughs> Groovy, huh? While you're wrapping your mind around that, you might want to know that middle-aged Oneidan women guided adolescent boys <laughs> into learning about physical interactions because the women couldn't conceive anymore and the boys needed guides. Pregnancy was viewed, by the way, as a drag on women, even though parents did not actually raise their own offspring. Children were rather sent into a space where they were raised by selected members of the community. And actually only certain people were supposed to procreate because they would have the best children, which is kind of a freaky sort of breeding program, which is super strange. If the word Oneida sounds somehow familiar to you and you had no idea that there was free love in the early 1800s in the United States, this might be related to the fact that the original Oneida community collapsed and some of the original members went off, they got married like normal folk, and they started a business. Oneida silverware still sold.
today. Finally, I want to talk about the transcendentalist movement because that impacted American literature in a large way and I think has the longest lasting legacy of all of these different groups of people that I've talked about, except for perhaps the abolitionists who do indeed see the collapse of slavery. Yay! Led by Ralph Waldo Emerson, the transcendentalists believed an individual could transcend his or her material reality and perfect his or her individual self. Okay, so it's it's going to be a hyper individualism, but 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 you are also still a part of a larger force in nature that's called the oversoul. And how do I explain the oversoul? Oh gosh, if you've ever seen Star Wars, I kind of think of it as the force. Henry David Thoreau, a protege of Ralph Waldo Emerson's, was probably trying to tap into that force while camping by himself on Walden Pond in the 1840s. Thoreau wrote an extremely famous book that is part of the American canon called Walden. And uh, it's something you probably read a little bit of in high school or would read in any college American lit class. I will admit while it's a very important piece of literature, I uh, read it if I need to go to sleep. Still, an educated person needs to know that Walden, Henry David Thoreau, all part of the transcendental movement. To be fair to me, before you think I'm a peasant who hasn't read much, Nathaniel Hawthorne, who is an equally famous writer from this period, was not really all that down with transcendentalism. He made endless fun of Brook Farm, which was a kind of commune founded by transcendentalists. Just to kind of lay out some of the thought process, uh, the people who lived on Brook Farm thought that if they worked together, they could get uh, the farm going, and they could sell their agricultural goods. And because they were working together, they could get through the work quicker. And then each of them as individuals would have more time for leisure and to go off and to think whatever thoughts they wanted to think as they developed their individual intellects without having to earn money on their own. Brook Farm failed and Nathaniel Hawthorne wasn't at all surprised because he thought this was a pretty pie in the sky, utopian sort of endeavor. For Hawthorne, the very premise that you can perfect yourself was a little wackadoo because he believed that people have a nature and human nature is, well, flawed. All that said, I do want you to know, I, I like some of Ralph Waldo Emerson's work. For instance, his essay, Self-Reliance, is an interesting thing to read. And while I don't believe in everything he asserts, I actually love an overriding theme within that essay, which is that man should learn to think for himself. Man, or obviously woman. <laughs> Anyway, uh, I hope that I taught you a little bit about some of the wild and wacky things that were going on in the early 1800s. What's one conclusion we might be able to make from all of this? I'd say it's in the American nature to test boundaries. A little like teenagers. And sometimes that's good. Sometimes it's not. <laughs> but sometimes it is. After all, when you encourage freedom, people will tend to pull you in weird ways, maybe too far over here or maybe too far over here in an endless tug of war between factions and different interests until sometimes you actually get pulled into the middle, which is where most people are. They just want to live their lives. They don't want to do anything weird. And well, we stay there for about half a second <laughs> until someone pulls again. Forget about the social movements. You can think a second about our politics. It's an endless cycle. Bye.